Hello and welcome to the RI Edge podcast. I'm Mark Bruno, Managing Director of Wealth Management at Informa Connect. And we are delighted to have Mike Lamina, the CEO of Wellspire Advisors, join us here today. Mike, pleasure talking with you again. And thank you very much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. It's, I'm excited for today's session. And I think it's a perfect time to have this conversation about growth in the RIA channel. As many of our listeners know, you've obviously been active on the M&A side, um, but you've also experienced some very, very significant growth since forming Wellspire officially in May of 2019. Before we get into the M&A and also some of the organic growth that you've experienced over the last year to two years, I think it would be a great place to start, Mike, just to give a little bit of the history of Wellspire. Like I said, it was officially formed in May of 20, uh, 2019, but I think it would be really helpful for our listeners to also understand not just the evolution of Wellspire, but your role. You've worn a lot of hats. You've been a buyer, you've been a seller, so you have a, a great perspective that you can add here. So if you wouldn't mind, Mike, just by starting us off and giving us a brief history of Wellspire, please. Certainly. So Wellspire, the, the name is relatively new in the RA space, but our legacy firms are well entrenched as some of the leading RAs over the past couple of decades. As you mentioned, Wellspire came about in 2019 as an entity through the combination of Sontag Advisory and Brofman Rothschild. Sontag Advisory was founded over 25 years ago by Howard Sontag, one of the original RIA trailblazers, largely a New York Northeast-centric firm with a long history of organic growth. Brofman Rothschild headquartered in the Maryland area in Rockville, Maryland. I was brought into the Brofman Rothschild business by Neil Simon, their former CEO, when he was looking to you know, exit the wealth management space and pursue political endeavors. Um, interestingly, the combination, the idea of bringing Brofman Rothschild and Sontag together grew out of an advisor from Brofman Rothschild and the COO of Sontag Advisory being on an industry best practices working group where every time they talked about an aspect of the business, they saw commonality, whether it was the investment process, the commitment to client service, leading with financial planning, all aspects of the business, how they compensated advisors. And that led Bill Schwartz, who is the gentleman from Brofman Rothschild, to float the idea of maybe we should have an exploratory conversation with the folks at Sontag. As you mentioned, Mark, Sontag hadn't really done acquisitions. Brofman had done acquisitions. And the, the deeper we dug in exploring putting those businesses together, the more our conviction grew that it would do two things, expand our ability to add value to clients and expand the opportunity set for our employees. When we actually looked at progressing that combination, it became clear the only path was for Brofman, the historical buyer, to become the seller. And when we put those two businesses together, I was fortunate to be asked to become the CEO of what we now know as, as Wellspire. And at this point, we're north of 13 billion in assets under management, 160 people, we're in 14 locations, East Coast, Mid-Atlantic, Northeast, recently opened an office in Florida. We have a presence in the Midwest, in the Wisconsin market. And our aspiration is to continue to grow through a strong client retention, organic growth and inorganic growth into a national scale leading RIA. Excellent. And I think the summary that you just gave is perfect because not only does it talk a little bit about the history and the DNA of the firm, but it, it speaks very directly to what you've now become, which is a, a, a national RIA, so just north of $13 billion. And there are not a lot of firms that have a, a, a very similar profile to Wellspire. And I think that's one of the reasons we wanted to do a bit of a deep dive with you here today is we wanted to learn more about your acquisition strategy, but we also wanted to learn more about what you have done from an organic growth standpoint, because there's really been some you know, very impressive growth there. Why don't we start on the M&A side? Uh, because there is obviously so much activity, as we've discussed before, and we've you know, talked about across wealthmanagement.com, we've just seen record quarter after record quarter, record year after record year in RIA M&A deal activity. You have been active, you recently made a very large acquisition that we want to talk about in a little bit more detail. But before we get into that specific deal, can you just tell us a little bit about what you're looking for as a buyer? What's the ideal acquisition target for Wealthspire? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It's something I get asked, you know, frequently. And I think the starting point for us is we're a fully integrated model. And the beauty of the current RA landscape is if you're someone who's looking to find a new home, get a liquidity event, maybe become part of a larger organization, all the possible options are available to you today. And they, they weren't you know, a decade ago, but now you can choose to have somebody make a financial interest in you, somebody who's going to allow you to join a larger organization and a loose confederation, but not really fully integrate. We're at the opposite end of the spectrum. It's a full integration model. So when we look at potential acquisition targets, um, there has to be that interest in the other firm in really leaning into a, a true integrated model. So beyond that, we're looking for fiduciaries, you know, true fiduciaries that share our unrelenting commitment to, to be aligned with our clients and, and operate in their best interest. We lead with financial planning, so that's critical. We're looking for RAAs that, that aren't you know, they don't have a token financial planning function. Our advisors, by definition, are financial planners. So that strong commitment and leading with financial planning. We want them to be collaborative, to really embrace the opportunity, to be a part of an ecosphere where it's expected and encouraged that you're actively seeking out opportunities to learn from each other and grow together. So from our perspective, there's quantitative measures. You know, if we're tucking an advisor into an existing location, we're probably looking at somebody with a book of 100 million in AUM. Standalone, the hurdle's probably a little bit higher if we're planning a brand new location flag, maybe that's 200 um, million. But one of the benefits we have, our parent company is NFP, and they are 6,000 people strong and have a, an, an international footprint, US, Canada, Europe. So that's also opened up some interesting opportunities for us to look at acquisitions in new geographies where maybe there's not the, the full critical mass. So for us, it starts with cultural fit and business fit. Do we think that this potential acquisition is going to be additive to our culture, lean into the integrated model that we have, and really be aligned with the way in which we want to conduct business, leading with financial planning, operating with fiduciary care, you know, collaborative delivery of the, the best that the firm has to offer to, to all clients we serve. I, I wanted to just take a moment and you use the term integrator a couple of yeah. times. The term aggregator has been out there for quite some time, but integrator, it's, it, there's a very big difference in your model and some of the other firms that are out there. Can you just talk a little bit about if you acquire a firm or you're in discussions with another firm and you're discussing what the integrated model looks like, what are some of the specific problems that you're solving for, right? In the best case scenario, what are the services, uh, said another way, that you're providing you know, to a potential acquisition target that seem to be resonating most right now? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, it's really leverage across the spectrum. What I see in the landscape is RIAs grow to a certain point and then there's critical inflections where they have to decide, am I going to make significant investments in technology capability, legal and compliance capability, investment capability, HR capability? What we've tried to do at our size and scale is build those functional utilities, those centers of excellence to give advisors leverage. So in many instances, I know you mentioned our rec recent acquisition last year, that was Strat Wealth, a $1.5 billion firm in the mid-Atlantic. One of the things that really resonated as we started to talk to them was the idea of lightening the advisor's backpack, taking load off their shoulders so they could do what they originally got into the business to do, which is serve clients and, and grow as a means to serving more clients and impacting more lives. So from our perspective, we've got a scaled investment function. I think that provides leverage. What we've been able to bring in terms of marketing, technology, you can go out and partner with some of the, you know, RAA standard client reporting solutions, platforms that are available, but it's been differentiating for us to say, not only do we have optimal, 
you know, pricing with some of those vendors, but we also have dedicated resources that are in the business of helping advisors maximize talent, maximize the capabilities of those technology tools. I'll give you a great example. We have a couple of people that are focused explicitly on the adoption, utilization, and creation of value through advisor technology. This, the leader of this function for us, Alia Wagenhofer, is a former financial advisor who was kind of moonlighting, using you know CRM, building workflows, optimizing our use of client reporting tools, and that's really what her, where her passion lied. And she actually migrated as we scaled the business into a fully dedicated role, working across the organization, actually helping advisors take advantage of the technology. It's not enough just to have the systems accessible. You actually need knowledgeable people that understand how will an advisor actually use this to create value for end clients and engage with them in active dialogue. So I, I think functions like that have really resonated with advisors as we've started to talk to them about areas that we can provide leverage. I appreciate it. And you mentioned strat wealth and I do yeah. want to talk about growth and specifically kind of where it fits in when you're evaluating acquisition opportunities, what it is that you're obviously doing to enable more growth. But I, I saw earlier this year that Jim DiCarlo was actually from strat wealth and moved into a new position as a chief strategic growth officer. Can you talk about that a little bit? It's an interesting role. And as we look at all the different RIA firms that are you know, over a billion dollars looking for sources of growth, I'd love to know a little bit more about sort of the genesis of that role and what Jim's focused on. Yeah, it's, uh, again, great question. So when we first started to talk to the Stratwealth team, we were impressed with the you know breadth of talent across the organization. Jim was their, their CEO and I had gotten to know him a little. And as we started to look at and get serious about putting the businesses together, logical questions came up as to, well, would Jim have a role? What would that role look like? From my perspective, our business is all about talent. The, the, the talent goes up and down the elevators, in and out the doors every single day. We don't have tons of investments in manufacturing equipment. This business really is about the people. So when we look at acquisitions, first and foremost, it's an opportunity to add talent to the firm. So the more I got to know Jim, the more I saw his relentless passion for growth. You know, Stratwolf had a view that it was all about serving others to make lives better. And his passion and energy to help advisors do that just kept coming through loud and clear. I was looking at our organization and saying, all right, it's very, it's a very different task to grow a $1 billion firm at north of 10% on an annual basis. When you start talking about firms that are 10 billion, 13 billion, 15 billion, 20 billion, it requires a different level of focus and energy being deployed to scale businesses and grow businesses at that size. So the more I got to know Jim, I just said, look, I want to invest in, double down in, put resource against our highest conviction ideas to grow the business. And that was a natural fit for Jim. So we put him into a strategic growth role and he's really looking across the organization, working with all of our financial advisors and me to define an all weather portfolio that we think gives us the best chance to grow the business, regardless of what is happening in the macro environment. So our highest conviction ideas where we have strengths in particular niche markets, where we can work across you know, NFP to connect dots, to get in front of ultra high net worth and high net worth individuals, really to look and say, where can we have success driving growth and how do we put institutional energy resources, dollars, behind it. So Jim runs our marketing function, and he also um, is responsible for engaging with all of our advisors around best practices towards the end objective of, of, of driving growth, which for us is all about reaching more clients to you know serve them to positively impact their lives. I appreciate it. I love that role. It's the, the perfect type of role in a lot of ways for what you mentioned before, once a firm gets beyond a certain size, incrementally, it gets harder to move the needle. So I appreciate you sharing as much background as you did, because I think for our listeners, they may think about that as well and say, okay, how can we take a similar approach? Maybe they're not $12, $13 billion in assets like you are, but how do you think about designating sort of control and responsibility, right, for growth to an individual or team of individuals? So appreciate the background. I think there's a lot to learn from there. Yeah. Um, just, and and one, one last point on that. Please. I think a lot of people would look at M&A and, and see 
a, a situation like that and potentially look to cut cut roles, right? To save dollars, yeah. to drive synergies in a combined P&L. We saw it as a massive opportunity to take a hugely talented individual, give him role clarity around something that he was passionate about that is beneficial across the organization. So again, our viewpoint on M&A is it's not about trying to, you know, squeeze margin and, and find synergies. It's about talent acquisition. If we can welcome not only talented advisors, but talented professionals into our organization, as you scale the business, you tend to go from generalist roles where people are wearing multiple hats to more specialized roles. And Jim's a perfect example, right? He doesn't have to worry about a whole bunch of things that in the past as CEO of Stratwealth, he did. Now he can be 100% focused on on growth, which is where his, his passion lies. And that's hugely um, beneficial to our organization. You're making this too easy on me because <laughs> my next question was actually about synergy value and what some of the sort of characteristics or some of the things that you actually look for when you're evaluating a target. And I am curious, I mean, that's a great example, but I'm curious, are there certain indicators or certain characteristics of a firm when you're looking at it, you can say, okay, the firm is worth X as a standalone, but if they become part of Wealthspire, we can help them grow exponentially. So with that, what are some of the sort of things that you look for from a growth standpoint when evaluating M&A opportunities? I mean, first of all, it starts with, do they have the desire, right? Because I think there's a lot of RIAs that you intersect with in in preliminary M&A conversations. And you kind of look in the crystal ball into the future, and there really isn't that passion, desire to grow the business. And look, we've done acquisitions where somebody is specifically looking to solve for something like succession planning. They've got a great book of clients. They care about they care about them passionately. They want to make sure that someone can care for those clients in a fiduciary way the way they have for years. We've had successful deals like that. But when I when I look at more strategic acquisitions, it starts with do they have the desire? Because if they have the desire and where we intersect a lot is with heads of RAs, because they're good at what they do, they've grown their business to a point where now they're wearing all these other hats. They're worried about real estate. They're worried about HR. They're worried about the investment process. They're worried about all these things that distract them from why they originally got into the business, which was to serve clients, engage with clients, have those financial planning oriented conversations. So if someone has the desire to grow, And we see that one of their pain points is lack of leverage. They're wearing too many hats. That's where I start to get really excited because I know we have leverage scaled utilities that can provide them leverage, lighten their load and allow them to focus on growth. So if the desire is there, the capability is there historically and we can actually free up their capacity, I get really excited about the opportunity to help accelerate their growth. The other thing that I would say is for us, we've got a strength in the, what I'll call ultra high net worth family office services space. And if somebody's at a point where as they've had more success in their business, they're starting to go further up market. I think we can definitely amplify that. I'll give you a great example. We have multiple dedicated in-house trust and estate attorneys that can work with advisors to engage on complex multi-generational estate planning challenges with clients. And one of the advisors from Strat Wealth actually commented that he had had you know, this extremely large relationship and he was serving a piece of it, but never truly felt like he could go after the entire wallet share because he lacked the depth and breadth of capabilities of some of the firms that he was probably going to compete against. And once he joined Wellspire, he felt like that fear went away because he was backstopped by an eight-person investment team, by a, a four-person dedicated trust and estates team. And he had the resources at his disposal to be able to engage in that relationship and try to win the entire share of wallet. So that's, again, I think where we can help advisors move further up and the complexity and wealth spectrum. Uh, but again, it gets down to, did they, do they have that interest? If they have that desire, then we can provide the, the leverage that enables it to happen. Yeah, I think it's an interesting way to just also look at the evolution of you know, the RIA 
channel. It wasn't that long ago that we were talking about how do you evolve and go from being a practice into a business, right? But now we're at a point that example that you just gave with how do you go from being a business to really more of a platform, right? That can be scaled. And that actually kind of brings me to the next set of questions here, just around organic growth. Um, while you did the Strat Wealth acquisition that obviously added to your size, your capabilities, your reach, you have had some strong organic growth and you've done some really interesting and strategic marketing since officially starting Wealthspire. If, if you don't mind, could you just give a little bit of background on you know, taking market appreciation out of the mix and M&A out of the mix? Can you tell us a little bit about what your organic growth rates have looked like and then also what's driving sort of the, the best results for you all? Sure. So from our perspective, we try not to overcomplicate things. When I look at the business, we work incredibly hard to win clients. We are passionate about serving them on an ongoing basis. So the easiest way to underwhelming growth is lose the clients you have. So for us, it starts with a target of 98% plus client retention on an annual basis. And why is that important? Again, because we work so hard to get clients, but also your clients are a source of flows on an ongoing basis. Can you continue to um, win wallet share from your existing clients? That's an important part of growth. Can you get referrals from those existing clients? So for us, it first and foremost starts with an overall high level of client retention. Then we start to decompose it and say, all right, the market's going to do what it does. We believe in our investment function and the high quality of levers they provide to our advisors, but we can't control the market. What we can control is our organic growth absent the market. So that's wallet share expansion, it's brand new clients to the firm. And for us, our view is to be a compelling business in the RA space. You want that organic growth target to be in the eight to 10% plus range. And as I mentioned, as numbers go up, the larger the numbers get, the harder it is to achieve those hurdles. But we believe that's the right measure. So we try to strip away our expectations for market because we don't know it's going to go up, mm -hmm. it's going to go down. We, we have a great investment team that focuses on the right asset allocation models, but we ultimately can't control that. What we can control is the activity associated with, are we winning wallet share from our existing clients? Are we bring, signing new contracts and bringing new clients to the firm? And our strategy, once you have that kind of target, is to say, all right, that's the enterprise level. Now, how do we get local in a market, whether it's our Madison market our Rockville, Maryland market, our rest in Virginia market. How do we develop a business plan that allows us to succeed in that market, recognizing the talented advisors we have, what unique capabilities they might possess, areas of, of practice excellence that they may possess, and then really putting resource behind that. So one of our areas of greatest strength in the Northeast is attorneys. We've got an unbelievable track record of working with some of the best partners at law firms in the New York tri-state area. And that's something that we try to lean into. It's a differentiating capability for us, working with multi-generational families, working with business owners, working with women in transition. You have to look at your existing advisor base and say, where are we really strong? And then kind of lean into those opportunities. The other thing that I would say is we, our ultimate parent company, NFP, has opened up a ton of opportunities for us to start to explore where Wellspire through our financial planning capabilities can augment capabilities that companies or individuals are receiving through other areas of NFP. So when we put Bronfman Rothschild and Sontag together to form Wellspire. We actually had two billion in assets under management on the Brofman side in the 401k space. We integrated that into NFP's retirement space because again, scale matters. Sure. And we knew that our clients and ultimately the people operating in that space would have more, there'd be greater value proposition in the end client and more career opportunities for our people if they were part of NFP's you know, scale retirement business. But what, what we haven't lost is any of that opportunity to collaborate. So if you look at the 401k space, from my perspective, it's no longer enough just to be great at delivering 401k fiduciary guidance to a plan sponsor. They're asking the question, well, what can you do on the financial wellness side? So we've been able to collaborate with our NFP retirement colleagues and be able to provide financial planning as a benefit, a financial wellness benefit along the lines of 
collaborating with NFP retirement, similarly on the executive benefit side. So we're scratching the surface of our opportunity to get in front of additional places where we can add value um, to end clients through our, our collaboration across NFP. And in the right scenarios too, right? The convergence between wealth planning and retirement planning is a really interesting opportunity. will absolutely be the subject of another podcast episode in the not too distant future. I promise you that. So we'll want to follow up and learn a little bit more about what's worked there as well. But I, I also do want to ask, I think one of the biggest challenges looking back at the past year, most RIA firms, the majority of their new assets have always come from referrals. They also come from, in a lot of cases, in-person opportunities and not just finding prospects, but when you are trying to introduce yourself and your services to an individual, being able to connect with them live and in person up until in the last year or so was a big part of gaining trust. So I am curious what your experience has been like since March of last year, when the world changed, everybody had to figure out how to basically go virtual and run virtual wealth management firms overnight. What are some of the things that worked really well for you all when you were operating in this sort of non-traditional environment? And how did you, on the subject of trust, how did you find that some of your advisors were effectively able to actually you know, gain new clients in the absence of sort of that physical and in-person opportunity? Yeah. So, I mean, the pandemic forced everybody to pivot. And I think the amount of adoption, the speed of adoption we got leveraging technology by both advisors and clients was exponentially higher than anything we would have had absent the necessity of, of the crisis. So from my perspective, all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where you can't meet physically in person, but people are craving guidance. And when you, over, when you, when you look at our business in a really simple way, that's when our clients need us most right? When they're questioning their hopes, their dreams, their fears. What was kind of unique about this pandemic was it wasn't only kind of a financial crisis early on. It was also a very human crisis mm -hmm. with a lot of people emotionally reacting to it. So we found that our clients wanted engagement more than they ever did. And all of a sudden you're in a situation where normally you'd be meeting face to face both the client and the advisor are now saying, okay, what do we have at our disposal? It's Zoom, it's Microsoft Teams, and the adoption went through the roof. So digital engagement, shorter engagements via video, actually I think is something that's going to be a huge long-term benefit for the industry. You don't have to travel halfway across the country to see that client in, in California if you're a New York-based advisor, you can jump on a quick Zoom call, have shorter impactful engagement with them via Zoom or, or Teams. And we actually found that it was deepening the relationship. So that was a positive. I think the other thing is, look, we're in the business of, of creating um, content that is compelling, right? It, it causes someone to think provocatively about their hopes, their dreams, their fears, their goals. You know, we're in the business of kind of planting those seeds that get someone to open up so that we can have that real human connection. And you just have to do it in a multidisciplinary way where we may have done that through a session where we were formally bringing people together. Now it was a blog, it was a webcast, it was a podcast. So I think the creation of content by definition, going forward, has to be delivered through multiple channels. We we have to meet clients as an industry where those clients want to be met. And for some, there's a ton of pent up demand to to actually get back in person, right? To sit across mm -hmm. a table from each other, to to have a lunch, to see people in in person. Over the last six week, I've been consistently coming back into our offices. And every time I have a hallway conversation with someone, it's validating of that unscripted face-to-face -face dialogue that you have and the opportunities that it presents. So from my perspective, I think our, our industry benefits tremendously and that we've been forced to adopt and lean into more digital engagement tools. Um, and the pent-up demand for getting back in person is only going to make us stronger when we can actually do both at scale. So definitely leaning into all things digital as a mechanism to, to reach more clients. And I, I think you've done quite a bit from, you mentioned video as a long-term yep. uh, element that'll stick around and obviously help 
you're not necessarily, are you talking about recorded video, Zoom, combination of the two? I just want to make sure that I'm understanding that properly. Yeah, I, th I think it's both. I think in okay. terms of advisors having opportunities to engage with clients, if I had said 18 months ago, look, we're really going to start to use Zoom or Microsoft Teams to engage with clients, I think there would have been skepticism on both mm -hmm. sides, right? My client yeah. likes to meet with me in person. I'm not sure I'm comfortable. The pandemic caused all of us to let down our guards. All of a sudden, you know, people are allowing each other into their homes and we all became more human. When you think about Wellspire and our advisors and where we do our best work, it's the human side, right? You have to be great from a planning standpoint, technically. You have to have a great bedrock of investment expertise. But our best work is about that human connection with an individual or a family where you understand what's their greatest hope, what's their greatest fear, what do they want to accomplish in a life of purpose and meaning for them. And all of a sudden we find ourselves in an environment where someone's you know, puppy jumps into a screen or, or someone's kid comes into the background. We all became more human and approachable. So it's technology which can feel a little bit cold and abstracted sometimes, actually humanizing. It's not the, you're only seeing me in this structured conference room. You're actually seeing sure. a, a more accessible human aspect. So it's that. And then I think on the flip side, like video, using video, it's great. Let's bring that expert in to talk about complex estate planning, but let's capture that so we can put it on our website. We can distribute it through social media platforms, find more ways to reach people where they intersect with that content at a point where they're thinking about something and it opens them up to a conversation. So I think it's both. Yeah, I appreciate you clarifying that too. I asked the question because it was just a couple of years ago, I was doing an advisor technology study and we actually... We're asking similar questions to investors and to advisors. And there were some questions just around communication and video specifically. And it seemed like advisors were very willing. And in a lot of the firms that we talked to actually had video conferencing and other types of you know, video elements in place. It wasn't the advisor's willingness to use it. The clients didn't want to use it. And now I think one of the sort of things that we'll see hopefully you know, play out over time is you know, exactly what you said, right? And it's not just the advisor, it's everyone is much more comfortable whether it's you know, FaceTime, Zoom, Teams, you name it. And this idea that the conversation just has to take place in a conference room. Pro there are probably some people who still prefer that, and that may always be the case, but there's just a bigger world out there of people that you all can talk to. So thank you for walking through all of that in as much detail as you did. I think we touched on quite a bit, both on the m &A side and also just on the marketing, business development, and client acquisition side. Mike, is there anything just on the subject of growth that we didn't touch on here today that you think would be important to address before we look? From my perspective, I, I think what's most important when I think about growth is it, it's got to be a combination of organic and inorganic growth. A lot of firms will talk about one or the other. For us, it's it, it has to be both, right? If we're doing a good job of serving our clients, we naturally will find ourselves in, in positions to grow organically. And that's the core of our business, right? It's about serving others to make lives better. And the way we do that is the next client, the next client that we can help, the next client where we can understand there's an opportunity to help them achieve their goals. That said, we're in an industry that is incredibly competitive. Every day, it gets more and more competitive relative to talent. So M&A, inorganic growth, is a great way to bring together really talented people. And if you can cultivate the right culture, it becomes a really powerful differentiator for us. I mentioned earlier that we're an integrated model. And some people will say, well, integrated, does that mean I'm going to lose the individual sense of who I am? And it's just, I have to follow your process. That's not it at all. It's how do we take really talented people, put them into an ecosphere that's all about sharing of best practices, um, defining the best way, not the Bronfman way or the Sontag way or the Stratwealth way, but the best way is what becomes the Wellspire way to ultimately enable our advisors and client facing people and all the support structure behind them to ultimately create good outcomes for our clients. So for me, growth is by definition, you got to retain your existing clients by servicing them in a really compelling way. You got to grow organically because 
any healthy business, it needs to have a strong level of organic growth. And then ultimately in a talent-based business, if you're not growing inorganically, you're going to lose the, the, the talent game. So to me, it's all three legs of the stool that lead to a really compelling business. I think that's a perfect way to conclude here. You touched on just about everything and I appreciate uh, how succinctly you were able to walk us through your M&A approach and strategy and also some of the things that have been working for you on the organic growth side as well. So Mike, thank you so much for joining us here on the RIA Edge podcast. We are really looking forward to learning more about some of what's on tap for Wellspire in the second half of the year. But for now, thanks so much for the update on everything that you guys have been working on and congrats on all the success that you've had in a really short period of time since officially launching Wellspire. Thank you, Mark. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And I think that the space you're operating in is really exciting. So excited to, to talk to you today. Thank you again. And thank you everybody for joining us. We're looking forward to joining, having you join us on the next episode of the RIA Edge. On behalf of wealthmanagement.com and Informa Connect, I'm Mark Bruno. Talk to you all soon.